going on everybody? It's Chip Walton, Chop and Brew. Oh, hey, what's up, mosquito? <laughs> <laughs> What's going on everybody, it's Chip Walton. Welcome to Chop and Brew. I am in the beautiful side room at Bad Weather Brewing Company in lovely St. Paul with one lovely head brewer of Bad Weather, Andy Ruland. Hello. Andy, cheers. Cheers. We are talking about a very cool program, a series that Andy and Bad Weather have embarked upon, the Heritage Lager Series. And before the beer's all gone, because it's moving super quick yes i just want to sit down with them enjoy a, a pilsner glass <laughs> of the first installment of the heritage lager series so cheers cheers what is in the glass man and who did you so kind of talk about this this isn't just you making up lager recipes so the, um I kind of start with the idea um a few months back popped up in my head um about you know, in this day and age with, with the brewing industry, it's everything's so fast and, and trends change daily. Almost, it's almost hard to keep up. Um, I thought, let's, let's pump the brakes on some stuff. Let's not forget about how we as an industry got here. Let's kind of go back in time a little bit. So the idea was to kind of go back with some of the older style brewers, brewing recipes, brewing techniques, ingredients. Um, to kind of pay homage to past breweries and brewers of, of um, locally or, or around the world. So um, I kind of started going down that rabbit hole. Um, my initial thought was to maybe try to create uh, recipes from now closed breweries, Minnesota breweries specifically. So there's no shortage of. Yes. So, but I quickly learned there's not a lot of data or um, historical documents on really? old recipes so huh. um, I did some research online I talked with Doug Holverson yeah. and, he, and he was like yeah no you won't find anything <laughs> so, so weird. I quickly learned that you know most brewers back then it was in their head mm. and then they taught the next brewer and it was in their head oh, and um, keeping a catalog of that kind of stuff wasn't um, as popular as I thought it might be so I kind of shifted gears on the whole idea <laughs> <laughs> um, so it was kind of just to maybe brew historical lager in general um, or collaborations right? or, you know, whatever kind of comes to mind. So um, that idea was kind of born and um, the first thought on doing a beer was trying to reach out to some of the old former brewers of the Schmidt Brewery just down the street. So, okay, yeah. Um, I reached out to... So you're not collaborating necessarily with like... The kid across the street with the tap room you're actually like collaborating with like the godfathers of these styles yeah who may or may not have any foot in the industry at, at all anymore yeah i you know another thing that kind of stuck in my mind is you know all of us here at bed whether we're members of the master brewers association of the americas um and there's a chapter here in st paul minneapolis they always have um spring and fall meetings and those meetings usually have a table with all of the old retired brewers and I every time I go there I want to go and sit down and I, I never have so I <laughs> that was another thing like I want to talk to these these people like they they've probably got so much more knowledge than we do and yeah. and and so that was kind of that kind of sparked an idea in my mind like I met one of the brewers we worked with was Sig, Sig Plagans, who was, I think, the second to last brewmaster at Schmidt. Um, I met him a few years ago at an MBAA meeting. Um, so I kind of tried to reach out to him, um, and um, he did call me back. I, I left him a message. It was kind of hard to track him down. I left him a message <laughs> via the MBAA website, and I got his phone number, and um, he called me back and he, he says he was kind of like what, what do you want what do you want to do here and so I kind of he's like well I had this idea and you know and I wasn't sure if there'd be interest like maybe that they've had their time with that and they're yeah. done and that's totally fine so yeah. uh, he said well let me think about it I'll call you back and, and uh, he he called me back a few days later and said yeah we, I'd love it'd be fun to do to work with a beer with you and the caveat being I want to work with Phil Gagne who was I believe the last brewmaster at Schmidt okay. Um, 
he still is heavily involved over at the grounds. You have Phil's well house. That's kind of his, he kind of, I think is the caretaker of the whole building over there. And oh, wow. Obviously has uh, a relationship with the, the guys at Clutch. Yeah, They've, with like all the keg and case yep. modernization, but also trying to keep it preserved. Yep. So the That's two of cool. the two of them were, were uh, willing to come out and chat, and um, we kind of came up with the the first beer of the series, which is um, we call it um, West Seventh Lager Schmitz Schmitz Lager. I sat down with Phil and Sig a couple times, and we kind of ran through some ideas and some methods they used to use at the old Schmidt Brewery because I was mm -hmm. I wanted to try to recreate a beer how they would have made it there best to, to our capabilities right. with our equipment um, and the ingredients we could get. So we ultimately came up with a, just a, a tr traditional American adjunct lager. What went into it that was something you maybe hadn't thought of before, hadn't definitely hadn't done before? Uh, we haven't done, we've done some, a little bit of strong brewing here. Um, generally we do that uh, at the end of the brew day, after the boil in the whirlpool, we might dilute if we um, mm. needed to adjust for gravity or if we were trying to gain volume. Um, okay. This method was totally different. We were diluting on the collection side. Um, so it was a little bit different um, way for us to calculate volumes. Yeah. Um, and uh, also with the mash temperature, we did a step mash, but we did a water infusion as okay. opposed to like a decoction or a, just a heated. Right. So kind of like um, like I used to home when I used to yeah. homebrew, I did batch sparging is what I did. I did a okay, yeah. a main mash, and then I would add hot water to yeah. raise the temp. That's how I would homebrew in my cooler at home. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's kind of what we did with this this beer. We did a protein rest, and then to bump the temperature up, we did a hot water infusion, which was pretty common for them over there. Just to really for the sheer volume of beer they were putting out over yeah. there. So that w that was kind of fun to strong brewing refers to like. Is it a higher gravity than you'd expect at a certain point of the process, and then yeah, yeah. Okay, so it's one way to increase your output, oh. um, either on the hot side or the cold side. You know, you could you could strong brew a beer and then dilute it on the finishing side if you wanted to, right? Um, to gain volume, which I think that's what most of the big breweries do to pump out that much that much beer in a year. But um, so that was kind of fun to work through some of the processes they use there yeah they came out for the brew day and um <laughs> it was it was a fun it was just an all-around fun fun experience of what great way to launch the the heritage lager series yeah what's so what's in this beer pretty basic beer uh six row and corn mm -hmm. uh cluster and cascade hops cluster yep. uh we did use um german lager yeast Traditionally would have had a different American lager strain, but it's what we had in-house at the time. Um, so oh, okay. um, we did hit, use the German lager. We did ferment it a tad warmer than we would have normally. Four-week tank time, so that's pretty quick for a lager beer for us. So kind of a quick turnaround. A little bit higher on the carb side, so we got a little extra spritz there on the tongue. Yeah. Um, again, pretty common with some of the American lagers. Um, yeah, just a nice, clean, crisp, refreshing extremely lager beer uh, as you think about the series obviously I doubt you're giving yourself like we need four a year or three a year but uh, you just kind of you want to find interesting projects and interesting people yeah and then bring them in yeah if, if it's if it's another collaboration idea reach out to maybe some former brewers um, or just historical recipes in general um, that's I, true yeah it's just kind of the sky's the limit. I don't really have a, a timeline or it's, we would like to keep the series going, I mean, indefinitely. Just, you know, every once in a while, oh, here's the next Heritage Lager drop and this is a, you know, a pre-prohibition lager or um, my next idea is um, kind of a World War II era lager is kind of the next hmm. thought. Um, what makes those kind of set apart in the Pantheon? Well, during the war, um, Barley and corn were used for other priorities, right. not brewing. But brewers were considered essential workers, so breweries <laughs> had to stay open. Yeah. So they had to find all sorts of other types of starch to, con to ferment out. So um, finding different forms of fermentables. Um, ca cassava or ca cassava uh -huh. was a big one. It's a root. 
Okay, kind of get two, almost like a potato. Yeah. Not quite. No, it, I think it's what they make tapioca out of. Okay. Um, that was a huge um, ingredient during the war, so I've been trying to find some of that. I haven't had much luck yet, so <laughs> at a large scale. Um, and uh, hops were also hard to find, so brewers were using different types of spices to spice okay. the beer. So that's that's one idea I've got, um, kind of hopefully for the next version of of the Heritage series. So um, yeah, I don't know. It's just kind of we'd like to keep one around regularly if we can, um, but we'll we'll see how things. I mean, the way this one is selling, we'll. I mean, we'll be out of this. Will be out in a couple of weeks, probably. It's been <laughs> selling ex extremely well. So, um, yeah, we got some some fun messages on on Facebook when we posted from some former, I think, coworkers of Sig and Phil. That oh said, yeah. Oh, my dad used to work with them, or it was, uh, or so it was cool to see that that connection. I think that that's kind of the idea with the is to you know, let's not forget about. You know, brewers of past or beers of past yesterday yeah. year. So, um, yeah. What seemed to impress them most about your spot on the day that they were in? I mean, I I imagine they don't just like go bouncing around brew houses in their retirement, or maybe they do. But uh, one thing they, they they did like we have a a, a DE filter, um, diatomaceous earth um, filter. Not a, there aren't a lot of breweries um, around locally that use that type of filtration. So that was like. They're like, oh, you've got a filter, and they were geeking out over that. And had they had them? <laughs> they had a DE filter at Schmidt. Okay. Um, and so that's how this beer got to be, like, yes. water clear. <laughs> it's awesome. Yep. Yeah. So um, that was cool. Uh, Sig was kind of, they were interested in the brew house. They know how the setup was. And, um, and uh, yeah, but I think the biggest thing was the, they were really kind of, Ooh, that's a nice filter. You know? <laughs> it was kind of fun. That's to, a nice filter. Yeah, I, we we the, between the three of us, we could have chatted about filtration for probably three hours. At the time, <laughs> it was it was cool. You know, Phil talked about the, the size of their filter that they had. You know, just dwarfs our brew house. Just to <laughs> to register that just how much beer that place really did pump out in its heyday is pretty astonishing. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that was before my time. Yep, for me too. Sure. Yeah. When did it close? I think, I think it shut down in the late, the early 90s for the last time. Oh. Um, you know, because they, they did close at one point. I think they were making, I want to say they were maybe making ethanol there or something. They were making some alternative product and then reopened. Um, and then I think they were making Landmark beer and Pig's Eye for a while. And then I think they closed, I think it was maybe the late 90s mm. when they closed. Did they tell you about the tunnels? No. Underneath? I, don't. I mean, I don't know if it's true. Like, Thomaser, you know, the COO yeah. of Summit, his grandfather, I think, was also a brewmaster. So, oh, cool. in that line, or a brewer or something. But apparently, the like the main brewmaster's house was across 7th. Okay. But there was a tunnel from that house to into the underbelly of the brewery for, like, blizzard, you know, for, like... Wow. 4 a.m. Yeah. start times and not need wanting to walk across the street. Oh, so I don't know cool. if that's true or not. I wonder. So we'll wrap it up here with Andy. I wore my Artemis shirt. My buddy, Abstract Artemis, is a, is a musician from Alabama where I'm from and now lives in Brooklyn. But he's like, on his world travels, he's just like such a loggerhead and oh, specifically cool. like a continental pills dude. Okay. But he loves an American pills too. So I was like, Art, I'm going to take you <laughs> to this tasting today so you can drink vicariously. <laughs> here you go, buddy. Andy, this is awesome. I'm looking forward to whatever else, whatever your next step is. Um, if you need some help immersion blending, some cassava, some cavasa. <laughs> what was it called? I think it's pronounced cassava. Cassava. How do you sure. pronounce that? Put that in the comments yes, below. Yes, please. <laughs> School us. Uh, we probably could have Wikipedia that, but I had no idea we were going to talk about it. So cheers, cheers. to all y'all. Cheers. On your, on your beer from the land of awful weather. Why? <laughs>
R- Rutland is a good one. With like a hard, uh, like where? Or even like a T, and it's like there's no T in there. Rutland? Like, yeah. Like, how are you getting? <laughs> in my home planet, there's a silent, there's a there's a vocal T after every H. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs>